Hello, my lovelies. Ginny O here, the author with no last name. And this is Ginny O Talks, the part of the program where I talk about various topics in the bookish and creative community. And today, I want to talk about pitching. As in, selling your creative product to someone else. Someone near me, who I trust, has told me that I seem to do better when I'm behind the camera, so to speak. Thus, I'm going to run around in Guild Wars and try to kill this Garfaz blood thing while I discuss pitching. As you can see, I've acquired some pretty new armor that should take me all the way to Lion Search, so I've dyed it purple. The yes acceptance dialogue box when I took this quest was CONSIDER HIM DEAD, which I thought was pretty funny, but here I am, a pretty small necromancer, but sure, CONSIDER HIM DEAD. I might die a couple times, that's the way it goes, so let's see how far I get as I'm using the courthouse as a staging area for higher level henchmen. Pitching is actually something that can vary between industry to industry. I've researched pitching for books, games, television, and fashion design. At the Academy of Art, where I went to college, they had a course called Narrative Documentary and it was actually a course about writing a pitch. The teachers never framed it that way, but you were writing a five-page persuasive paper to sell an idea. If they had framed it as a pitch, it might have been an easier to understand class. Pitching is not something that is easily understood unless you're a natural salesperson. There are people out there who are really great at selling water to fish. Okay, if you aren't someone with a natural marketing flair and in, in the advertising industry, coming up with a pitch is work. There are three things we need to keep in mind when we are trying to sell a product. One, the type of pitch we're doing. Two, our audience of our pitch. And three, the content of our pitch, which is determined by one and two. The picture advertisement is probably the simplest, and yet not simple, type of pitch. Whether it's a book cover, an ad in a magazine, a billboard, or a movie poster, you get one image and maybe a name to sell your product. If you're lucky, you might get a tagline. A picture pitch is really easy to mess up because you want to add all these fiddly little details when what you need is one very strong image. Movie posters with dozens of characters and explosions without a strong composition and book covers with tons of tiny details you won't see in a thumbnail are guilty of this. There's a reason a watch ad is usually just the watch and maybe part of a guy's suit. Kettle One got away with years for doing really short black and white ads of witty phrases. Strong clothing ads is a hot model actually showing off the clothes. Taglines are the next biggest form of a pitch. You've got five words or less to convey what the entire thing is about. 007. Bond. James Bond. License to kill. You can make fun of the Taco Bell Chihuahua all you want, but Yo Quiero Taco Bell is a certain part of cultural history. For mystic writers, we've got the tagline of Chase Your Dreams. And you know, but remember, dreams can also be nightmares. But that's like a subheading. Next are Twitter pitch events. Okay, this is usually in the book community. They set aside certain times of the year for certain genres where agents will watch certain tags filled with 140 characters or whatever it is now, pitches about manuscripts. And if they like those pictures, they're asking you to send them your query letter in first five pages, basically. We'll get to queries in a bit. There are a couple formats for Twitter pitches. You've got a narrative format, you've got a comparison format, and you'll want a couple of these if you're going to participate. It's a way to get further up in the line, I guess. Very limited time events, everyone swamps the text. Then you have the elevator pitch. The premise of an elevator pitch is you've got 30 seconds in an elevator with a CEO. Convince them to buy your product. First off, 
don't pull this bullshit. The CEO is in the elevator to get from point A to point B. Don't do this in a bar or any place unsolicited. If someone asks you what your creative product is about in a social setting, then have an elevator pitch ready. This is the dreaded author nightmare. Tell me about your book! The content of your elevator pitch, like a Twitter pitch, is going to depend on your audience. An elevator pitch can also be something above the read more on Amazon. It's the summary before the actual summary. Then the next in length is set aside for books. This is the query letter. 400 words or less to an agent to sell them the concept of your book and you as a writer. A lot of times, query letters will be paired with the first five pages of your book. Different agents have different preferences for query letter formatting, and there are some agents that never look at their slush pile at all. I like the query shark method because I feel it cuts out a lot of the bull hockey. Some agents want to know why you chose them and don't want to hear the truth they are agent 25 out of 80 and accept your genre as an answer. That's why I like the query shark method. It cuts straight to the chase of selling my book instead of trying to stroke the ego of an agent. The next is back copy for your book. Back copy is a summary of your book that covers the important plot points but doesn't give away the ending. Back copy is sometimes called the blurb. Old movie jackets used to have these too. How long your back copy is going to be is going to depend on the style of blurbing you do. Outside of Amazon, back copy has kind of fallen out of favor, and instead you might end up with a picture of the author, or reviews of their other books, or I don't know. The only place you might find any blurb or back copy at all is on Amazon. I don't like picking paperbacks and not finding any back copy. Usually I put those books down. Please sell me the story of your book outside of the cover, which may not be at all accurate. Of course, there are plenty of times the back copy isn't accurate either. But basically, it needs to fit the back of your book and be 10 to 12 point size. I think I use 12. I also use 6 by 9 inch mass market size, so it does give me more room for back copy. So this gets us to the one-page document. A one-page document is going to vary by industry. What a one-page document is going to look like in the book industry, aka a synopsis of your book, versus a one-page pitch document in the television or game industry is going to be very different. Sometimes, say in the television industry, a one-page document is more like a two-page document, same for a book synopsis. Sometimes an agent will really want two pages. So in the movie or game industry, this will cover setting, characters, and the story arc of the show or the game, and might have art or pictures to set the mood. The five-page document is the first five pages of your book. And this is to show you can hook a reader in the first five pages. This is what you typically get for a consumer. If you can't hook them by the first 1,000 words, they're more than likely to put your book down. Not every reader is going to shove past the first 50 pages. And if you don't like that, then I can't help you. Self-publish? Then we get the 10-page document. This is more for games and television. Sometimes agents will ask for 10 pages of your book and not 5. Sometimes they'll ask for 30, but that's really rare. A 10-page document is more in-depth version of the one-page document. You get 10 pages to flesh out precisely what your television show and game is about with the characters, story arc, setting, and for any games, game mechanics. Lastly, we have more visual pitches, things like trailers, and in actual in-person physical presentations. In fashion, you'll have mood boards, illustrations, and flats. Or if you're lucky and have the money, you can do a fashion show, which is a form of a pitch. You're trying to sell your garments to buyers of stores, not necessarily the customers, though we get a preview of those things coming up in stores. Visual presentations can include storyboards and presentation boards, trailers or pitch reels, also known as sizzlers, and a lot of you talking. This is the Shark Tank, Dragon's Den, Project Runway's fashion startup. You and investors or studio heads in a room with you talking at them and them asking questions. And this doesn't touch on actual commercials or YouTube and Instagram style community influencing marketing. 
these pitches are going to be different based on who you are trying to sell your product to, and I don't mean age group. How you word and phrase your pitch is going to be different depending on if you're talking to a creative peer, an industry insider like a CEO, studio head, or agent, or if you're actually trying to sell your product to a consumer. This is when you need to know your audience and what is and isn't socially acceptable. There are times when it isn't appropriate to sell your creative product, such as at the grocery store, in an elevator, or in a bar, unless they ask. And there are places where you are encouraged to sell your product, and you're going to have a limited time, and you're going to be getting through these really jaded investors who are going to look at you from a visual level to the materials you give them and how you present yourself. Do you look professional? Are your materials professional? And are you acting professionally? What they are going to want to hear is going to be a lot different to what a customer or a parent is going to want to hear about your product. So you have industry leaders and industry gatekeepers like agents. This is a lot of cold submissions, pitch meetings, and pitch events. So this tends to range towards the more visual and more technical type of pitching. They want to know if you're an acceptable risk. The important thing to remember is with an investor, you want to push the hook of your creative product first. Not the backstory, not the map, not a list of mechanics, and then when they ask, have the boring technical stuff ready. Page count, movie length, game mechanics, budgets, profit loss. Whatever it is you think you need to convince them there is a viable market for your game, book, or television show. But first, you have to get them excited about what you are selling without comparing it to something else or being a list of things that puts them to sleep. They will want to know about other games, books, TV shows in order to compare profits and ratings. That's how they are going to determine if your creative product is viable. Did this other person move units? Did this other game make a profit? Did this TV show have good ratings? You have customer pitchers. Who is your target market? And you're going to have to think about the customers that are hardcore customers versus casual customers or even new customers. They also want to know what it is about your creative product that makes it fun and better than the other games they've experienced or books they've read. And is it like other games they've already played? And then, if you're making a game or a cartoon or something for kids or YA, you need to think about the parents of your customers and how you're going to sell your product as fun and safe for their children. Lastly, there are pitches to your fellow creatives. You might want to sell your fellow creatives on joining you in making a project happen. And you want them to be excited and passionate about the product as you are. And not be there just to do a job and collect a paycheck. When people love their work, it shows. And they're probably going to know more about your industry than the average person or customer. So you're really going to have to sell them both on the story of the product and how this product is different and is going to challenge their abilities. Be specific. It's a new target market. The story has a twist from other products. We want to push our capabilities of our tech. Even those sentences are too general. Sell your story. Sell your market. Sell how you want to challenge yourself and your consumers by changing what they think about how they're interacting with a specific product and stay within known technical capabilities. Like, it's okay to push things, but you can't promise the moon. If the technology isn't there, it's not there, and it's not going to come about by the power of wishful thinking. But if there is technology coming, and you want to take advantage of it, and don't fall afoul of copyright, <sighs> And then you should explain that to your fellow creatives. You're going to need a range of pitches that vary in scope and depth. Scary, isn't it? This gets to the content of the pitch. So there are generally two or three types of pitches. There is a narrative pitch where you are trying to sell the story. You're going to summarize the story with or without giving away the ending depending on what the pitch actually is. This is going to focus on characters and conflict, aka the plot. 
Then there is the comparative pitch, where you are going to try to sell your product by comparing it in a better light to other products. It's this plus this. You see this a lot in the book industry, sometimes in the game industry. Comparative pitches worth vary depending on who you're telling them to. An insider is going to have a different take on a comparative pitch than a customer. And if you give an insider a comparative pitch to them that's ludicrous in terms of profit and franchise viability because you're new, they aren't going to want to pick up your creative project. And there are some comparisons you may only want to make as proof of concept that it works and there are customers out there for it. And it's always going to depend on their knowledge base. That's why for customers, you're going to see a lot of big names like Harry Potter, The Hunger Games, Big Bang Theory, Star Wars, and so on trotted out when people do comparative pitching. Like I say, Heaven's Heathens is the Expendables meets Sons of Anarchy with werewolves. But in order to get that, you have to like action movies, motorcycle dramas, and werewolves. So. I'd have a couple comparative things ready, even if you're comparing general genres over specific properties. Lastly, there is an informational pitch. The informational pitch is the numbers. This might be game mechanics, episode or book plots, it could be your budget, it could be how many words are in the book and how many other things you've published or awards you've gotten. This is the most technical pitch, and what you trot out for industry insiders and businessmen who want to know if you are a safe bet to invest their time and money into. In another video, I did a five-part narrative pitch for Mystic Writers. The player character is invited to horse summer camp, and if they win the district championship, they get a full scholarship to an elite school, and they'll be offered internships towards getting a job. They're claimed by a horse and on their first ride go through a sparkly plant arch to a winter wonderland and learn they have magic. They are a harmony magician and need to learn all the magic in every district. Harmony magicians are rare and come about every 50 to 100 years. However, the player meets another group of magicians who use a different type of magic than the ones taught in the districts and they want the player to join them. Who is right? Is magic supposed to be this way? What happened? What is harmony magic? What happens if one side of magic overtakes the other? World endage? The loss of creativity? Will the fairies die? Does it have anything to do with those dratted mermaids? Okay, yes, that's as short as I was doing it. It needs editing. And once I finished the five parts of my narrative pitch, I went back and explained what parts of the game mechanics each part of the pitch covered without it being a list of game mechanics. I might not have made that clear enough. Personal stakes slash conflict slash challenge, a goal narratively, mount system, racing, PvP, camp things, social systems, player housing, and customization mechanically, reputations, professions, game theme of growing up, genre, portal fantasy, chosen one trope, choose your own adventure story, magic, Horse bonding slash personalities, factions, story replayability, faction exclusive mounts and pets, more personal conflict for the player character, big overarching outside plot, challenge slash conflicting goal, save the world, and magic genre conventions, oh the story possibilities. In no way would I give that narrative pitch to anyone and then go back and give the list of game mechanics after. That's just dumb. I was using it as an example of how you can cover narratively the mechanics of your game. What you need to touch on can be done without saying a list of mechanics that won't, well, sell your game to a specific set of people, especially if your mechanics are really broad and not attached to any story. That narrative pitch was, well, created at 3 a.m. I did this with my query for Heathens too. The final, final draft was started at 3 a.m. in a notebook. This game pitch was written in mind for someone who is not an industry insider or someone who doesn't play a lot of horse games. I was trying to sell the story, which can tell an industry insider if they think about it, what type of mechanics they might see in the game, and yet make someone excited about the game in general. How you phrase your pitch is going to be 
depend on who you are talking to. If you are trying to sell the story, you need to focus on the story with the main character, what the conflict is, and the stakes if they fail. Again, doing a comparative pitch is going to depend on if you're talking to a CEO or to a genre fanatic. Okay, if you're doing a comparative pitch to a book agent, there are books published in the last five years, hopefully two or three, and aren't New York Times bestsellers. Doing otherwise is going to get your book in the reject pile. If you're doing a comparison pitch to a consumer who knows and loves the genre, then saying, okay, it's Harry Potter meets Narnia will get you excitement versus being passed over. And if you're going to compare your game to another game by saying it's better, then you need to go ahead and say how it is better. It's a portal fantasy like Star Stable with RPG and platform mechanics stuffed with min fun mini games instead of being a horse collection and racing game with fetch quests. Okay, this sentence you don't say out loud. If the CEO or studio head actually knows what Star Stable is, then they'll have an idea about what your game is like. It might be better to call it an open world Barbie Horse Adventures meets Okami. It'd be slightly more accurate without combat and with lots of minigames. But if your audience doesn't know anything about games at all, then once you sell them on the narrative aspect of your story, girl goes to summer horse summer camp in order to win a scholarship for a school, finds out she has magic and there's another side trying to take over the land, and will she join them or stop them, or is there a third way? And what happens if one side wins anyway? It's bad, right? Then you have to sell them on the mechanics without invoking other games. So it's an open-world, choose-your-own-adventure horse-riding game with races and environmental puzzles and full of options like farming and creating items and mini-games like bubble shooter, puzzles, rhythm games, or dress-up style games. It's about knowing your audience and the social situation. How much time do you have and how much do they really care and what do they know? So, what about to my fellow creatives? How would I tell them? Well, this game is going to challenge them. This is an almost untapped market. In the open world horse market, you've got Star Stable. That's it. Almost everything else is shovelware or low concept free to play mobile games lacking story. And if you want to make games for girls and think they deserve games with as much story as Guild Wars or World of Warcraft or even something like The Witcher 3 gets, then this is that project. Let's take young adult books and make a game out of it. We want to take no mechanics from games like horse racing games and RPGs we know girls like, such as life skills and customization and cosmetics, and then add in the mini games like dress up and bubble shooter and dance games we also know they like to create variety versus combat and fetch quests. We want to do this in Unreal 4, or preferably Unreal 5. And I know, I know, MMOs and Unreal are, if you don't want to do it, make your own engine. Unreal 5 has shown a couple of features, such as the AI-style animation features with environmental tracking, which can cut down on how many animations you need to make for jumps, etc. And their loading features and portal feature, which can bring up a new map in the same space, basically, almost seamlessly, if the animation feature could be adapted to horses, it'd be very helpful. And a large part of our game is Portal Fantasy, where we want to be able to show the map the same map in another season and try to make it as seamless as possible. Plus, the Unreal Lighting is a lot better than other engines I've seen. Because of the long production times of MMOs, starting with Unreal 5 and trying to pair it back in polygons because we don't need that many polygons unless we're making this a PS5 game or something and that wasn't the plan is a decent option even if it's not going to be released until April 2022. If you want to make a game and have it run in 2025 or beyond, you want to get the latest engine you can if you aren't willing to build your own. Then on the art side, it's using the Victorian style in a variety of combinations with different styles and in a modular way as much as possible. I hope, in order to make things look pretty from the clothes to the buildings to our dragons and griffins and glowing elemental type creatures and fairies and mermaids, the only game I can think of I know is remotely similar in style is Bless, 
and that is reaching. And that is a very specific technical type of pitch. I'd only do it to another game designer because it's going to make most people's eyes cross. And for things like Kickstarter, you're going to string these in a row. You're going to start with an elevator pitch that's probably a combination of a narrative and comparison pitch because the audience for Kickstarter investors are most likely going to be consumers. You're going to have a sizzle reel. Then you're going to do a longer narrative pitch for it. And yes, give a list of game mechanics and perks, but that's a Kickstarter in its own form of visual presentation on a web page to peer investors who may or may not understand the risk involved in investing. So, when it comes to making your pitch, be aware of the type of pitch you need for your industry, whether it's a short 30 second chat to a full out visual presentation, who you're giving your pitch to and what social context, a fellow creative, an industry insider, or a consumer, and choose what goes in your pitch accordingly. Narrative, comparison products, or technical information. And your pitch might be more successful. One, if you need help writing a query, synopsis, or a blurb, run over to my website, ginny0.wordpress.com. That's ginny, the number zero, dot wordpress.com. And in the book section, you can find my handy post-fiction production guide called I Finished a Book. Now what? It's free. Over 300 downloads thus far. Give it to your writer friends. And while you're there, you can check out my books. A Slice of Life Look at Werewolves on Motorcycles with Firefights and the Occasional Explosion. Thank you for listening. And take care of yourselves. Bless. Stay safe. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.